and thank you for joining this session of the McGill Executive Institute's Level Up webinar series. My name is Eric Sane, Director of the Executive Institute, and it's a pleasure to welcome you. This session is going to last about one hour and include time to answer your questions. We'd ask that you go ahead and turn off your video right now by uh, hitting stop video to the left and the lower end of your screen. And you can uh, submit questions by clicking on the chat button at any time. This session is going to be recorded and will be sent to you afterwards. It's my pleasure to welcome today's webinar leader for today, Nathaniel Haims. Nathaniel is a faculty member of the McGill Executive Institute, and he's a specialist in helping be people become more customer centric, more strategic, and better business communicators. Pamela Sorrenti, our Director of Open Enrollment, is gonna be your moderator for today. She helps develop impactful seminars, and she's a learning advisor for our clients and organizations. So thank you again for attending. And with that, let's get started. Over to you, Nathaniel. Thank you, Eric. And good day, everyone. We are failing our customers. And the current disruptive environment will shape which organizations will succeed far into the future and who may not. The differentiating factor is how well organizations will respond to their customers. Thank you for participating in today's webinar. Today is about customer engagement. Nothing here is really rocket science, certainly not in an hour. However, some helpful reminders on how we should try and engage with our customers, especially during this unprecedented period. Today is an interactive session, and as Eric just mentioned, I encourage everyone to utilize the chat function in Zoom to share ideas and ask questions at any point during this session, and we will take some time to stop and answer questions along the way. We will start off today by describing a recent live situation, and I'll be asking you shortly through a poll that you'll see on Zoom to share how would you feel about it. Imagine just for a moment, in fact, if you're in a comfortable environment, close your eyes for a moment and start to imagine. You purchased a car a few months ago, a new car. You woke up today, you went outside to get some essential groceries and the car would not start for the second time in successive weeks. You immediately go back inside and call the dealership where you purchased the car and you leave another voicemail, hoping and praying that just this time you'll hear back soon. Within a couple of hours and with great delight and surprise, the dealership finally calls you back. The service person on the other line listens to you describing the problem and says, unfortunately, this is not a true emergency right now. And I'm going to ask you to please call the dealership back on Friday and request a service appointment at that time where there's more people working. So I'd like for everyone to open their eyes. And we're about to raise a poll on the screen. And the question is, how would this situation make you feel? Good morning, everyone. So a lot of people are answering right now. There's a lot of frustration in here. So you, you know, um, uh, a lot of angry, a lot of upset. Uh, really, there's just, it's an, a lot of frustration. People are feeling a lot of frustration with this situation. Nathaniel, do you think that is uh, typical? Absolutely. Um, very typical, right? So some words here to describe some of our feelings. Some of us feel a little angry. We feel upset. We feel frustrated. Interestingly, some of us also feel empathetic. Um, and we may also feel that maybe our purchase of the car was actually regretful. And this is generally a stressful time as well. So 
And you know, some people say, I just want to go out and get my groceries. That's all I really need to do right now. So really the question is here, this is just one touch point that you have with that organization in this particular case. And so the question is, which dealership will you return to? How does this experience make you feel? And how important do you feel to this particular organization? So today is about customer centricity. How can we help to effectively engage with our customers? These are principles that should always hold true, whether you're in a business to business environment or a business to consumer environment, the same principles always apply. Now is the time for us to stay connected to both our employees and our customers when really they're most needed. So our roadmap uh, for this session is to spend some time defining what customer centricity is, how it can be measured. We're gonna use a three-step structure this morning to improve on our customer engagement levels from really behind the screens. We'll then share some illustrations and some examples of some organizations who have done this really well. And ultimately our goal today is for all of us to be more effective in creating a customer centric culture in our respective organizations. So let's first define what we mean by customer here. And customers can be defined in multiple ways, but for today's purpose, we'd like for everyone to consider a customer being either this is a customer who's external to the organization or potentially internal to the organization. Today applies to both organizations that are involved in creating products and or services. If you are working in a manufacturing role, a sales and marketing role, a human resources role, role, all of these roles within an organization are connected back to our customers. And so for example, in the pharmaceuticals industry, is it the patient? Is it the physician, the hospital, the insurance companies, the government? Or in some cases, when we're considering an internal customer, potentially a sales team can be considered a customer. So I'd like for everyone to, as we walk through the, this session today, I'd like to, for everyone to spend some time thinking about their own customer groups and their organizations as we reflect on some ideas this morning. Some of you may have direct contact with customers and some of you may have indirect contact with customers through colleagues and other teams. In the end though, we all impact the customer. So I'd like to invite everyone to use the chat feature in Zoom um, and to answer the question, why is engaging clients so important right now? Why now? Um, okay, we have some answers starting to come in, Nathaniel. So we have keep in touch um, because we're isolated, uh, stay in contact. We have, <clears throat> ooh, this is going quick today. Social isolation, human interaction is beneficial. Uh, we need to stay relative and competitive, uh, keeping the, communicate, the community connected, differentiating yourself from everyone else. Um, a lot of staying connected here because of the crisis. Um, you know, because there's no face-to-face -face content, the uncertain times, we're losing face-to-face uh, -face time, so we need to keep in touch. Uh, let clients know that you care about them for stickiness of the customer, like that one. Uh, stay connected, let them know that we are here for them. I think these are all really valid points. Absolutely, and so really this, this essence of staying connected with our customers and, and really what's happened is really a disruption, especially now, right? Things have changed. And so when we start thinking about why now, and was, as we sit behind our screens, we're thinking about how can we now engage with our clients and our customers? You know, we need to be thinking, have our clients and our customer attitudes and their preferences, have those changed? And, and as we reflect on that, we should be thinking about ourselves. What has changed for us as clients, right? When we're putting ourselves on our client shoes, What's changed for us? And things have changed. And how have you felt that the companies around you, have, how have they listened? Do they understand you right now? 
And have they been able to adapt to meet your needs as those needs have changed? Okay, so the why now is really, this has really highlighted the importance of as things have evolved and things have changed and really lots of what we, have, what we used to do has been disrupted. How can we really be attuned and listen to our customers effectively? So we'd like to invite everyone back to the chat. Um, and um, as we sort of now delve into uh, customer centricity, I'd like to everyone to answer this question, what is customer centricity? And for some of you, this term may be, may be new. So we'd like you to think um, of the term customer centricity, what words or phrases come to mind? And I'd invite you to go into the chat to share your thoughts. Okay, so thinking of them, customers first, responsiveness, putting uh, customers' needs in the center, prioritizing the customer, listening, service, uh, the customer comes first, the focus is on them. Uh, defining your strategic plan around the customer. Our, our client is the central point of interest and concern. Customer is at the center of everything we do. Um, product customization, priority, meeting the needs of the customers aligned with your needs, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. And you know, that's, and, and that's exactly it, right? It's a combination of understanding of how do we center our decisions around the customer. And some of you may noticed in there, um, frequently, you know, when we think about customer centricity, um, some people in, immediately sort of go to, you know, great customer service, great customer experience. And these certainly are extremely important aspects of it. When we think of customer centricity holistically, um, you know, a great customer service and great experience is an output of a customer-centric organization. Customer service is generally dealt with as a reactive measure. It's something that we're sort of responding to customers and creating a great experience is something that's proactive. Um, you know, an organization will go out proactively to create a customer experience. But what embeds it, and we heard it there in the comments, what, what really embeds customer centricity is the idea that this goes to the motive of wanting to deliver a great customer experience. So it's the underlying foundational part of creating that great experience in the first place. So the intention of customer centricity of the company is proven by the delivery of its customer experience. It's not the customer experience of itself in itself. Okay. So the idea here is, is that customer centricity is a philosophy. It's an approach. It's really a way of being, and it's something that really impacts when done effectively, all of the operations and the ideas of that organization. Okay, so this is a foundational element of an organization akin to, to really a culture. So I'd like for us to spend a, a few minutes um, on this particular slide, and this starts to highlight some of the nuances between um, what you see on the left-hand side of this slide, the customer-centric culture versus what's called an organization or a product-centric culture. And uh, we saw that in the comments um, that when we're, we're focused on a customer-centric culture, really what's driving the decisions and the questions and the answers is placing our, our clients and what their needs are first and then deriving results from the organization. And so the idea for customer centric is looking from the outside into the organization versus what you see on the right side of this slide, an organization or product centric culture, which is looking from the inside, what do we do now looking out? And so let's sort of work through some of these because there is a nuance here. But what I'd like for everyone to appreciate here is that these nuances and the way, in ways that these questions are asked actually deliver different answers and different results in different directions for organizations. And so start with the first one. So what do our clients need to get done now and how can we help them? This is an extremely important question, especially now because things have changed. And what our clients need to get done now was not the same than necessarily what they needed to get done two or three months ago. How can we help them? This is an insightful question and a question that when we talk about empathy soon in a few slides, a really, really important question right now that we should be asking all our customers, how can we help you right now? And so when you flip that question and you look at it, some of you may be more familiar with the right side of this slide. And this is one of the key ways that we can tell how an organization 
where they're sitting on the scale of between customer centric and product organization centric, they'll be asking questions like on the right side, what product services can we sell to our clients? So starting with that product first, then figuring out what can they sell? What relationships do we need to establish with our customers? And how can we make money from our customers? So it's really about the we first clients come after. On the left side, customer centric, we're talking about what relationship do our clients expect to establish with them? What value do our clients need to see before we're willing to pay, before they are willing to pay? So again, it's a nuance. Um, and I would ask that, you know, as you, as you go back into your organizations and your roles, that as these questions come up and we hear them time and time again, the right side tends to come up first, but we should try and reframe these questions so that they're focused a little bit more on the left side. And so the next question that comes up is, um, customer centricity sounds great, but how do we measure it? And there's really um, multiple ways that we can measure the success of customer centricity. And you'll see in this slide, there's you know, a list of ways between growth and sales and profit, net promoter scores, which is you know, uh, um, looking at, at, at um, uh, customer satisfaction and how um, that sort of satisfaction level and referral level moves forward with time. Customer lifetime value is something that's really important as we look at our groups of customers and how can we calculate what their uh, value to that organization for the lifetime uh, would be a really important and complex metric. Uh, surveys, reviews, referrals, uh, some organizations will even look at returns and refunds as a way to measure um, uh, how centric, um, or how customer centric an organization is. But really, you know, that there isn't one particular way and the takeaway from the slide, there is not one score. The question about customer centricity and measurement is not just one metric that organizations will come back and say, tick, I've done it, I can now move on. Um, what we're talking about here is the culture. We're talking about a philosophy and it's really a way of being, okay? And that's what I'd like to, for us to, to think about as we, as we start talking about um, these elements around customer centricity. So on this slide, and, and at the end of the slide, we will stop and take some questions because I see there's been some questions coming in um, through the chat function. And if you have any questions, please feel free to do that because we'll stop um, just, just momentarily. Um, when we think about customer touch points, there are multiple ways that customers um, connect and sort of touch your organization. And um, as businesses grow and become more complex, and as we've moved really um, into this digital landscape, those touch points have become extremely critical. Um, and so these, these sort of touch points can be broken down into three categories between static experiences. This is how a customer uses a product tangibly or a service, includes retail outlets, which of course in most jurisdictions right now around the world are closed, uh, newsletters, um, advertisements, things like that would be considered a static experience. Human experiences, these are sort of voice-to-voice -voice interactions, I'm sorry. So these would be voice-to-voice -voice interactions. Um, and you know, this would be discussions with the sales staff, with the marketing team, phone conversations, um, but, you know, potentially interactive chat sessions as well be considered under human experiences. And digital experiences or interactions that we have with websites, with apps and with other social media. And in the current climate, you know, there's things have been disrupted. So for example, in, in the digital, some websites, because people have been you know, overloading on websites, um, some of the websites have gone down. And in some cases, some, some organizations did not have the ability to sell online, right? And so how can they navigate through this period of time without some of those important abilities? And so we think about you know, all the different aspects here between the, the, these three groups, as well as static experiences of retail outlets closed. These are all really, really important elements that come together. There's really two takeaways from this slide. The first one is these experiences are touch points which formulate into a customer journey. So I'd like for everyone to think about each and every one of these elements as customers go through their experience with your organization. These are multiple touch points that formulate into a journey. It's not just one particular touch point. And as clients and customers come into your organization, it, they don't necessarily start and stop with all the same touch points. So for example, a, a client may start off and say, I want to go online, I want to do, do a little bit of browsing, understand you know, this particular organization. I next want to go into the retail outlet. 
which by the way, in some cases they can't do anymore. And then I want to come back and I want to look at reviews, right? You may have someone that says, you know, I want to go and speak to a friend first and, and learn about, you know, what their experience is with this organization. So customers come in and out through multiple different touch points at different times. The second key takeaway of this slide is that the customer journey with a brand is not linear. It changes all the time. So customers go through a level with time of happiness. So peaks, and then there's moments in time where maybe they're not as happy with the organization and there's different touch points that they interface with. And so all of this really forces us right now to be acutely attuned to our customers. We will provide you a tool as part of, um, um, as part of an email that you receive at the end of this survey, at, at the end of today's session, which by the way, will include a survey. Um, but you'll actually receive a tool that will, that will outline the steps of, of this particular slide that will help you think about these touch points as you consider the areas of focus for your particular organization in this climate. So it'll be a reminder of all the different touch points that we have and thinking about how you can help the experience of customers. So I'd like to stop here. Um, this is somewhere through our, our midpoint and I'd like to take some questions, please. Sorry, I was muted there for a second. Um, so Nathaniel, one of the questions that came through is how does the quality of service provided uh, impacting, impact customer centricity? Absolutely. So, you know, when you look at um, quality of service, um, it's extremely important, right? So when, when, you know, we think of customer centricity, it's really a culture that's really embedding an organization. And so it's really the foundation and part of the outputs of that is to have excellent customer service. Now, this does not mean that as organizations, in order to be a customer centric organization, we need to do every single thing that a customer says. Okay, it does not mean that we should do that. It doesn't mean that the customer says X, Y, Z, that's exactly what we should do. But as an organization, as long as we've got the foundational basis of a customer centric organization, we already understand from our customers what's going, what, what did they expect of us that we can deliver great customer service. So it's really a symbiotic relationship. You start with a great um, foundation of customer centricity and what feeds into that or the result of that is great customer service and a great customer experience. Mm -hmm. So it's really embedded in the culture. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so another question coming through, uh, what are your thoughts about snail mail? Um, you know, uh, someone's boss here thinks they should do a mailer with a printed brochure. Um, but, uh, this person thinks that it would be best to send an email and follow up with a phone call. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's a really interesting question and it is company and industry specific. Um, I, I would suggest that right now as we're, um, as we're, um, looking at, at using different avenues, I, I would suggest, I, I think it's an interesting idea because we need to start thinking about all the different tactics. And so I know that, you know, the clients that I speak to, we're all getting inundated with email, right? We're all getting tremendous amount of email from all organizations that we reach out to. And so when you think of it from the client perspective, the clients are getting all different types of emails come through. And sometimes things like sending a postcard in the mail, just saying to your client, hey, I'm just hoping that everything's okay, just wanting to check in with you. Sometimes just picking up the phone and just saying, look, I want to check in with you. I hope everything's okay. Is there anything I can help with? So thinking about other avenues like snail mail, like picking up the phone, like sending in a LinkedIn message potentially, all really important things as we think about our toolbox to connect back with our customers. Thanks. Um, so I'll take one more question for now and we'll have some other uh, time for, for questions. So I'll keep track of those. Um, what are your thoughts on chatbots? They try and mimic a human experience, um, but sometimes the customer feels like they've been fooled a little bit. Do you think that that ends up as a negative experience or a positive one? Yeah, so what we found, and, and especially we've seen, you know, quite an influx of the last um, six to 12 months or so, is, you know, a lot of our chat boxes live have gone to the AI um, sort of automated machine that's sort of doing a lot of answers and, and what research has found is actually customers find that quite frustrating. Um, some of the time they do find that if they're able to get the answer quickly, then that's great. And that's the important thing about chat. So as we're thinking about chat and thinking about implementing AI, 
the critical thing that the customer wants in that moment is a quick response to their answer, right? They want to get an answer to their question. And you'll notice, we'll actually talk about it in a few slides. Um, they expect an answer on chat within a couple of minutes. So if you have a, a chat that is forcing a customer through a series of questions and actually not even ending up at a live agent, not very helpful right now. Now, there have been some organizations recently that have implemented this because of, um, you know, they don't have the ability to have live agents. So, um, you know, it's really something that's interesting, customer specific, depends on what your customers are looking for. At the moment, I would suggest that having a quick response time is, is really important. So, you know, I personally have been on chats where you get on, you speak to, and then you hit, I would speak to a live agent and it doesn't go anywhere. And so that's a terrible experience. So those are the types of things that we want to try and avoid doing. So as long as it's well planned out. As long as it's well planned out and it's coordinated um, and that, you know, if you're able to provide the information on a chat quickly, then absolutely the AI works really well and, and it mm. gives the client a resource immediately that they can deal with and answer. Yeah. Um, but if you have an AI that's formulated in a way that it's taking a client through three or four questions and you're pushing them outside of that three, four minutes in order to get, that's where you find disengagement. Right. And that's where a client will say, you know what, I'm going to exit, I'm going to exit this. I've had a terrible touch point with this organization and I'm not sure that I want to now do this again. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for those questions. And absolutely. I encourage these questions to move forward. We, we will stop again. Um, towards the end of the uh, presentation to, to take some additional questions. So I thought this was, uh, was kind of neat. Um, I, I've actually been using this for, for a while, but this is really pertinent right now. And so, you know, here's an organization um, that says, look, here are all the things we don't do, right? We don't refund, we're not gonna exchange without a receipt, we're not doing price match, we're not taking coupons, we're not even gonna answer the phone right now, we're not gonna smile. And by the way, we're not gonna make any exceptions to these policies whatsoever. And so. You know, the company behind the desk says, you know, sorry, 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 I can't do these things. And the client says, well, well, wait a second, like, is there anything that you can do? And so this is the sort of dichotomy. Um, and, and this is, you know, really something that we're seeing today, right? And for some cases, in some cases, it's quite valid that some organizations are just not able to accept refunds due to, you know, health considerations. Um, but we really need to start thinking about how our customers feel in this moment, because these experiences don't get forgotten. And so when they're reaching out to you and they have a need and they've expressed something, what we need to do is start listening. Okay. So I'd like to share this model and um, there are certainly many models out there. I think these three steps and these three considerations are the most important ones that we need to start thinking about right now. And the first one for us is to listen carefully. And right now we need to do that virtually. And so we'll talk, we'll spend a bit of time just talking about what that can look like. And we need to do that internally with our colleagues. There's lots of Zoom meetings going on and, and, and lots of, sort of virtual meetings. And we need, to, we need to sort of listen really carefully to our colleagues as well as our customers. Right now, really, really critical. Empathy. Empathy, something that's really important and this is really to imagine, and we started this off, right? I asked everyone at the beginning to close their eyes and start to empathize with that story. And, and, and really the purpose of that is, is to imagine how you felt in that situation. And so, you know, how would you like to be treated if you were the customer? Um, and just a side note, I actually had when you, I Googled uh, a while ago, an icon for empathy. And it was, it was sort of ironic because the icon when you Google it is sort of two hands intertwined, just like this, um, sort of handshaking. And then I realized quite quickly that that would not be a socially distancing approved. And so I, I went for the next one, you know, the next icon down, which, which was this one. And this is the idea of being connected, something that's really important right now because people are going through quite a lot. And as organizations and, and employees of organizations, we need to be showing tremendous amount of empathy. And sometimes it's just about asking the question, how are you feeling? How can I help you? Response, really important. We need to be quick and we need to be proactive. And evidence, there's lots of evidence around the fact that quick response times are an extremely strong indicator of customer satisfaction. 
and even the propensity to buy. I've actually had a case where I've written into an organization and um, they responded with me to me about my concern within nine minutes. And it was a personalized response based on that situation. And so it didn't really matter actually what that response had to say. The content of that response didn't matter. The fact that the response happened and it was by email within nine minutes and it was personalized, that meant to me that this organization felt that my business with them is extremely important. And that builds tremendous amount of loyalty. Okay, so three steps we're going to walk through. Listen, empathy, and a quick response. Okay, so I'd like to invite everyone back into the chat. Um, and I'd like to ask your thoughts right now around what gets in your way of listening. What's in your way of listening? Responding is one of the answers that came through um, processes and procedures, distractions, replying, so responding, too many tasks, prejudices. Um, my own concerns, asking follow-up questions, I guess the, the stress of, of planning those, time, multitasking, um, my thoughts, not having answers is a fear, uh, loss of focus, the workload, too many commitments, personal mood, the to-do list, the never-ending to-do list, um, email notifications while I'm video conferencing, that's, that's for sure, uh, too many points of entry for customer feedback. So not enough streamlined processes. Uh, in most cases, thinking about my response workload. So we're getting a lot of, a lot of similar issues from people here, uh, Nathaniel. Um, the need to respond quickly. Yeah, yeah. These are, these are all, all really important things. And, and I think as we, as, as we think about, there's really so much going on right now, and especially when at home and we've got you know, work and kids and, and animals at home and all kinds of different things and family members that we're looking to take care of. There is really so much going on. And so I wanted to share here a few tips around how we can, how we can try and, 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 and be more effective at listening. Um, some of these are, are really pertinent as we, as we um, are moved to a more virtual environment. Um, because, you know, we're used to sort of, you know, being in an environment where we're, we're listening sort of face to face, things have slightly changed. And so I'd like to share um, some of these ideas. Um, and so, you know, the first one is interruption. Um, and this is, this is one of the, the sort of classic things that sort of gets in our way is, as, as, we, as we sort of embark on, on, on listening um, is an interruption. And we do that naturally, right? So as we're listening to somebody, if, if you know, communicators communicating with us about something that we're really passionate about in that sentence, and we just want to jump in, and it's the idea that we have this kind of gerbil in our wheel that's sort of spinning as someone is listening, as, as, as we are listening, as someone's speaking, we're, we're thinking, we're already starting to formulate what our answer is um, before that other person's actually had the ability to finish their sentence or finish their paragraph. And so um, interruption is something that I would ask everyone that we should try and hold back on, especially virtually, because it's sometimes a little hard to, to understand where, you know, when is someone going to finish that sentence. And so we always want to jump in. We'll talk about silence in just a second. Um, distractions. Okay. It's a big deal right now. We've got lots of things going on at home. We've got, you know, cell phones and other things beeping and dishwashers going off and all different types of things. So we should try and avoid distractions as much as we can, especially in those moments where we need to really focus on listening. I want to make mention about lunchtime and hunger. Um, one of my major distractions and something that we do see generally, it's really hard to pay attention and listen when we're hungry. Sometimes when we have meetings that go over into lunch, we haven't had enough time to sit down and actually have that nutrition. Um, what ends up happening is we have a difficult time listening because we're just thinking about being hungry and we need to get some food in us and, and drink. Um, so that's something else to just keep in mind of. Sometimes repetition in our own words. And so we're hearing, and I don't mean to be parrot fashion here, but as we're listening to just actually repeat back what we've heard and that allows both the person who has just spoken as well as the person who's listening just ensure that there's a true understanding here um, and so that's sometimes helpful sometimes taking notes is really helpful for some people as they're looking to actively listen asking questions is sometimes a good way to just gain some additional clarification or just to acknowledge the person speaking that you've actually heard something 
So asking questions are really powerful to do with our customers right now. Um, don't be afraid of the silence. And this again is, is as we sit behind the screens, um, it's become just even more awkward than it is even in person. Um, but let's not be afraid of it. It's an extremely powerful tool. Um, and you know, we, we should use it, especially with clients. We're asking an insightful question, wait for, that, for, wait for that answer to come. What we find, especially when we're virtually, we all feel the need to sort of jump in right away and, and fill that void, fill that silence. But use it, use it at the right time, but use silence, it's extremely powerful. The golden rule really about listening is, you know, it's possible to say too much, but it's rarely possible to listen too much. So as we think about customer centricity and think about this first aspect of our model, listening, um, extremely important that we listen to our customers right now. So some additional strategies around listening to improve our listening, pay attention to what isn't said. Um, and, you know, so we're talking about nonverbal cues. Um, and, you know, we, we have to make now a conscious effort to try and capture this, non, this nonverbal views, because not nonverbal cues, because we're doing that across the screen, right? So these are things like eye contact, hand gestures, really important things that we can pick up as we're looking to actively listen. Um, we can optimize digital platforms. So these may be surveys um, to understand as well how customers are interacting with our websites. Where are they going right now as they're navigating? Because likely things have changed. Um, leverage thoughts and ideas as we're looking to listen back to our customers. Sometimes we don't have the direct nature to go back and speak with the customer directly. But let's leverage the thoughts and ideas internally from our colleagues because more often than not, there is a person or a department in the organization that has those insights from our customers and we can share it within the organization. One of the other things that I wanted to touch on here is that, you know, we're getting a tremendous amount of communications. And so as you're thinking about communicating out to your customers, one of an effective, an effective way to ensure that you've listened well is to ask yourself the question, what are the most pressing needs and concerns right now for your customers and your clients. And what that forces you to do is to synthesize down these communications because what we're tending to see over the last few months are paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs of content being sent by email. And sometimes these are essays. Um, and clients and customers, we just don't have the time right now to start going through all of this content. And so it, it, what this forces us to do is to really think about, have we listened to our customers do we truly understand what are the most pressing needs and concerns right now? And let's start with that communication first, okay? So I'm gonna now shift um, onto um, the second part of our model, which is around empathy. And um, I will uh, say here that I do not have uh, any affiliation with Intact Insurance. Um, and Intact Insurance, this is a video I like to play for everyone. It's a short one, it's only about 30 seconds. Um, but I think it's a really, really neat video um, as, as really what, what this particular organization coins as empathy is everything. And, and that's really um, what they have been pushing. And so, you know, this is an ad that has been playing um, on TV and it really captures the idea of stepping into the shoes of this organization's clients. It's imperative that we understand how our customers feel when their life gets turned upside down. Great first day, team. How does that make you feel? It makes me feel sad. Hold on to those feelings. Embrace them. And always keep them right up here. Congrats. You just completed your empathy training. <laughs> Intact Insurance. Talk to your broker. And so this is an organization, um, in this particular case, the gentleman um, is an insurance agent that having to deal with people calling uh, with people that have had a car accident. And so this, I'm not suggesting anyone goes out and, and does anything like this, but really I think it hammers home the point that in order to have empathy, we need to be very close, have really, really close touch points with our clients organization wide to really understand and we can empathize with our clients so that when we have those interactions or we've got a decision to make or a question comes up, 
we're taking and answering that question with the client's view. Okay, so empathy really provides the insight. It's really a true, full appreciation of what the client may be feeling and thinking in those moments. And we need to feel it. We need to be able to feel it for my, for, for my customers so we can make the right decisions. And that's extremely important right now. And just by asking our customers, how are you? How are things doing for you right now in this period? And how can I best help you right now? Shows a tremendous amount of empathy. So the third sort of pillar of our model is around um, response. Uh, we talked a little bit about it when the question came up about chat. Um, people do not like to wait. Our customers do not like to wait. They don't like to be put on hold. They don't like when they arrive to a website that takes forever to load. And they don't like waiting for a call or for an email. So we need to do the best that we can so that, so that we have an extremely good response time, even with lower staffing levels. And so, you know, our customers expect it. In fact, 20, about a quarter of our customers who wait hours for response are likely to not return back to purchase from that organization again. And so customers expect a quick response time. It makes them feel important. The example that I shared about getting a response within nine minutes, it made me feel important. It didn't matter what the response actually had to say. And even bad news needs to be delivered fast. And the reason for that is that as customers wait, we always think the worst. As customers, as we're waiting, we're always thinking for the worst. So we, a quick response time deals with that in an effective way. We don't want to leave customers hanging. And so you'll see there on the bottom half of the slide, sharing just some tips around what customers expect. And some of these are, are you know, the, the, these are customer expectations. And it is, of course, organization and industry specific. But on chat, and the question came up earlier, they're expecting to connect with somebody and have the answer dealt with within one to two minutes. And so if your AI is taking you a period of time in chat, well, well beyond that, that's something that's probably worth looking into. Okay, but they're looking to get an answer very quickly in chat. Phone, they're expecting us to respond within three minutes to be able to connect and get the question answered. That's what's being expected in general. And email, the expectation is around one to two days. So we know that we're in challenging times. Those expectations, customers do have currently a sense of empathy and they do understand that times have changed and, and organizations are challenged. But these are the expectations that we've built up. And so, you know, when we're calling a particular organization, they're saying you're going to have to wait on hold for an hour and 40 minutes to try and speak with an agent. What is the impact of that touch point with that organization? Okay, it, 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 and it impacts quite significantly. So we'd like to share some illustrations. Uh, we have three here in total, and I think this particular one is, is really neat and really relevant right now is we're all online and we're ordering online. And so this is an example of a sock manufacturer. Um, as you go online and you place your order and you get that email that says, order's been received, here's your order number. And they say, you know, shipping's underway. This is a standard thing that we all do. But here's an incredible way that's being described. And I'm gonna read this out. I think it's really, really beautiful. Our careful shipping team folded your socks to perfection, wrapped it up gingerly and carried it triumphantly all the way to the post office. The mailman was then informed of the importance of your order. We struck up the band, we blasted the anthem, and we saluted your package as it was shipped away. Rest assured, your package was given a proper send-off. We hope this puts a little pep in your step. Don't forget, this is a sock company. And we're wishing your package safe travels. Now, of course, this is cultural for this particular sock manufacturer, but it really highlights the, the idea that they're really paying attention, right? People are concerned when we place an order, sometimes we don't hear anything. Sometimes we get one email and then the delivery maybe now is taking a week or two to sometimes deliver. And so creating those touch points in those moments when things are quiet are really important. And here's a really beautiful way of sharing with our customers how important that period of time between order and having something arrive um, at your home or at, or at your office, how important that period of time is for that organization. And so a beautiful way of illustrating actually what is going on in that period of time 
and how important it is for this particular organization to uh, have your package arrive safely. In the second example, um, and this example is actually one that, that came to me, um, and it's a couple of years old now, but I think it, it really highlights the point around data analytics. And data analytics has been an extremely important focus. Um, it's been a really big focus in many years right now for organizations that we're looking to collect data around our customers. And as we're listening to customers, we're throwing it into CRMs and trying to sort of data mine and, and try and figure out customer segments. But here's an example of an airline that's using their data sharing it with their customers to build loyalty. And it's really about how this particular touch point makes a customer feel. And so, you know, in this case, you know, the airline said they have, you know, they say the greatest gift you can give someone is your time. And we're grateful that you've chosen to spend so much of that or, or so much time um, with us, you know, with us in the skies. And what they've done is they've actually taken that data and they've recapped it to say that, you know, Nathaniel, you spent 84 hours in the sky, you've flown around the world one and a half times, well, obviously not doing that in, in, in 2010, in 2010, 2020, I'm not doing that this year. But, you know, the case is that I, I didn't know that. I had no idea that I was, you know, flying around the world one and a half times, it's kind of neat. And I, critically, I didn't know that the airline was helping me save a thousand dollars in check bag fees. And so here's an organization that's saying, you know, this is really important. We want our customers to understand the value that we're providing. And as we're, as we're traveling, you know, it's, it's hard to get a sense of that. And so here's a recap. Thank you for it. Here's a recap of what you've done and how much we've helped you save. And we look forward to seeing you back next year. Okay. So I wanted to share this example because data analytics for all of our organizations is really important. This, is, well, this was an effective way of using some of the information that we're mining actually sharing it back to create value and create an amazing touch point. The CMO came to me just around Christmas time. Everyone generally feels good around Christmas time. It made me feel great and it made me feel important. The last example I want to share um, is um, a very recent communication. And this came from an, an, an energy utility company. Um, and right off the bat, this was an email that said, I hope you and your family are safe and well. And that was empathy right there, right at the beginning, very short sentence. I hope you and your family are safe and well. They want to share some good news. And the good news is that they are being proactive. They're not waiting for government intervention. They're not waiting for me to call and say, you know, I've got limited resources, whatever the case may be. They're saying, we're going to take a one-time decrease of 25% off your future bill. And that's some good news that we wanted to share with you. Okay. So again, proactive and empathy. In this particular case. So in summary, and we'll take questions, uh, if there's um, any additional questions, please feel free to go into the chat and add them now as, as, as we address them. Customer centricity is, is really about action. It's not about the talk. And, and saying that, you know, that the customer is always the first pri priority is just not enough. An organization must demonstrate a commitment to a positive customer experience. And that's, by, and that's done by teaching the right skills and implementing a company-wide philosophy that starts with leadership and it should permeate through every individual in every department. A customer-centric firm doesn't tell you that you come first. It actually shows it to you. And I hope that the examples that we just shared demonstrates how, how those things can actually be shown, how, how customer centricity can actually be shown to you. It's not about speaking it, it's actually about the act. It's about doing it. So I wanna sincerely thank everyone for their time. I hope that you've received some value this morning uh, to help refocus your attention back to customers from really behind the screens. Um, and let's open up to take, um, to take as many questions as we can. Great, thanks, uh, Nathaniel. So we do have a few questions that have come in throughout uh, the presentation. Um, what if you have two different customers with misaligned objectives? So one buys your products and the other one gives you the required permission space to sell them. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, and that really goes back to the idea that, um, and, and, and I guess what I'd, I'd like to make the point that 
when we think about the customer, it should not be necessarily thought of within an organization as a singular. We don't just have necessarily one customer. And I think this question highlights the point that, yeah, we've got different customers in different segments on different spectrums. And so we need to be thinking about those differently. And so those are two different customer groups that need to be thought about very differently. Still possible though. Absolutely, yep. Yeah. So there's many organizations and go back to the pharmaceutical example, mm -hmm. the pharmaceutical company will say, look, I've got patients, I've got hospitals, I've got insurance companies, I've got pharmacists, I've got physicians, I've got multiple different, I've got, you know, um, manufacturing companies that are actually providing uh, certain active ingredients. So that the full spectrum, each and every one of those may be different, diff completely different customer groups that need to be dealt with in a very different way. And, and the reason why that's important um, is because those customer groups have different needs and they have different wants. And so we need to understand each of those groups independently. And you may find that between those two groups, they may have some things in common and that's great and that's helpful. Um, but they're, they, it typically, invariably, there are, there are multiple things that are different and we need to be able to talk to those groups differently. Yeah, great points. Okay, so um, next question. Do you have any insights or strategies on how a national brand can interact with its customers on a, on a personalized level? And I think you did give a, an example there with the airline you spoke about. Um, but what are some different areas? Um, the, the specific question here is different areas of the country are having different experiences with this crisis. So how do you address them? Uh, how do you address them uniquely? Yeah, absolutely. So great question. Um, and when we talk about a national brand, um, you know, that's, that's always the challenge, right? When, we, when we've got one particular brand and we're, we're sort of reaching out to, um, you know, 300 million people in, in, in various places and sometimes even internationally, right? Um, so I think what's really important is to break down those segments, again, of the customer group. So if you take one particular customer group that we thought was originally homogeneous, right now, that particular customer group is not homogeneous. And so we need to start to think and divide out that customer group to think, okay, what subgroups do we have within that customer? And how can we take that national brand um, to, to actually talk to them? So for example, um, you know, a communication that you're sending out to customers about the current situation or how your organization may be different. And so we take an example in the US, you may have some states that, 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 that are in a different um, um, sort of, position right now versus other uh, other states and we need to talk to our customers differently so don't hesitate just because we've thought of a particular customer group as a homogeneous group originally they may not be right now and likely they're not and we need to start thinking about them as subgroups and instead of sending one email out to all our customers to communicate how our organizations are adapting we need to start segmenting further and thinking about various customer groups and potentially multiple emails going to each customer group that talks to their needs specifically. Mm -hmm. That's great. And actually a comment that came in from Marilyn here is that testing is key and there's no one answer fits all. And I think that speaks to exactly what you're saying, Nathaniel. Yeah, absolutely. Test and learn is, is extremely yeah. important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, I think what's critical is that, you know, there's certain things that are wrong, right? So if we're, we're calling in and we're on, on the whole, you know, on, on the phone for three hours and, and the wait is three hours, we need to deal with that critically. But, you know, customers can be also forgiving. And so testing and learn is really important. Understanding, you know, we're sending communication. Let's rate, let's get our customers to rate these communications. Has this communication been helpful? Those are additional ways as you're sending out communications, even by email, let customers rate them because that allows us to listen to our customers and understand, was this helpful? Do you want to see something like this again? Or what else would you like to see? Great, thanks. Uh, so another question we have here is, if a customer's response requires further research, and you, essentially you can't give them an answer uh, right on the spot, is it okay to inform the client that you've received the inquiry um, and you'll get back to them with an answer? And if that is okay, what's the best practice when providing timelines for customers? Yeah, so great question. And the answer is absolutely it's okay. And in fact, it's encouraged. And so, um, and, and this is where sometimes we get caught, right? So we get a question comes in, we're not sure what the answer is, and we leave the customer hanging. And that's quite possibly the worst thing that we can potentially do, because in that moment, as I mentioned earlier, in that moment, the customer's thinking the worst. 
And so what, what is really important is exactly what we just referred to is to get back with the client and saying, researching it right now. And the answer to the second part of that question is, um, we want to ensure that we're not over promising. So one of, the, one of the pitfalls that we see is if we were to respond and say, look, we're not sure, we're doing some research, we'll get back to you. And if we say we'll get back to you within 48 hours, we need to make sure we're getting back to customers within, four, within 48 hours. And so what I would recommend for a timeline is give yourself a little bit of room so that you're not making that promise that can potentially be broken. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, so another question here is, uh, if your customer doesn't want to share video chat during a call, should you still show your face? Yeah, great question. Um, and I think the answer to the question is, um, yes, you should. Um, and, you know, I, I don't see uh, why you shouldn't, as long as you're in a comfortable environment um, and it doesn't cause any, any distraction for your client. I think we need everybody to feel comfortable virtually. We need to make sure that if our clients are not comfortable to be, have the video open, that's fine. Um, but I think it's important for your clients to actually see your body language, right? So communication, when you look at the communication, there's, there's multiple components, but a, a, the, the largest component is really in body language. And so the hand gestures, the facial expressions, the eye contact, really, really, really important. And so absolutely share your video, but I would not suggest forcing anyone else to share that. Perfect. So last question uh, for today, Nathaniel. Um, due to the situation we're going through with the new norm of life and work, and um, we're finding today's sales cycle is much longer than, than normal. So up to which extent do you think that changing these um, or incorporating these strategies uh, will shorten the sales cycle? So I think it's a million dollar question um, and, and it's a great one. I mean, you know, we're not sure how long the situation is, is gonna go on um, for, um, but it seems that, you know, the situation is setting the new norm. And mm -hmm. so um, what we can do, the best that we can do is if we can listen to our customers intently and actively and frequently, that gives us the best chance of reducing that sales cycle. Things have changed. We have been disrupted. Most of us have, if not all of us have. And whether it be retail stores, or we're not producing the flyers that we're used to, and we don't have the contacts that we're used to, or people in organizations have changed. Um, the, the critical part, and really the essence of this presentation, is to say, in order for us to succeed as organizations in this new world and in this disruptive period of time, the key to that success and the organizations that will remain and succeed into the future are the ones that do exactly what we've talked about in the last hour well. And that is listening, showing empathy, and responding quickly. Great. Thanks, Nathaniel. I think I agree. Uh, definitely. So I want to thank everyone who joined, uh, joined in to make this session a success. There was a lot of uh, conversation in the chat, which is really nice. Um, Nathaniel, I also want to thank you for introducing us and reminding us of the culture of customer centricity. I think there's a lot of elements here we can all really reflect on in the days and weeks ahead and ask ourselves these really important questions. Um, so just uh, some closing remarks. Uh, within the next 24 hours, you will be receiving an email from us with a recording from the session and as well as the takeaway tools that Nathaniel has uh, mentioned, um, the three-step approach and some of the reflection questions that you can bring to your organizations. Um, there's also going to be a feedback survey that we're providing and we would really uh, very much appreciate if you could take the time to complete it. Just take two or three minutes. Um, it really helps us to refine our sessions in the future and gain insights on the topics that, uh, that you want to hear about. Um, so again, thank you for attending this session in our Level Up series. Uh, we'd love to stay connected, so definitely uh, feel free to send me an email or add me to your LinkedIn network. And our next session for everyone's information will be on Friday with Jackie Robert, who will be speaking on leading in ambiguous times. And we really hope to see you there. Stay safe, everyone.